Well, there's certainly some really fun things about being a pastor, like coming up here and speaking at Ignite. I'm having a good time. Are you guys having a good time? But let me tell you, there are some things that aren't so fun. Uh, And there's some places where it's not fun to go and speak as a pastor. For instance, last year, in 2022, I did two funerals for babies. Two funerals for babies. One of them didn't live one day, was born, and immediately there were serious problems, and the baby died that day. The other one lived about uh, just over a month And it was particularly brutal because the baby was in the hospital for a while. And then things seemed like they were going well. The baby went home. And then after about a week of being home, the baby started getting worse again. They had to go back to the hospital and and the baby died. And it it was really sad. And even one of them, we did a graveside service. And I'm standing there with the workers from the funeral home, right? This is these guys' job. They do this all the time. They're They're taking caskets to gravesides in the hearse. This is what they literally do every day for a living. And even those guys are shook up, saying things to me like that they shouldn't make caskets this small. That's the world that you guys live in. You guys live in a world where, I guess you could say, truly awful things happen. I mean, that was a hard moment. Tears were shed by everyone that was there. And that's the world that you're living in, a world where you, you would just look at it and say, that, that's a terrible thing. And someday, something like that, if it hasn't already, is going to happen to you. There, there's going to be something that happens in your life or to someone close to you where you look at that and you say, that's terrible. And in that moment, who are you going to trust? Because the question that's going to come up in that moment is where is God? Where is God in all this? When you're standing next to the graveside of somebody that you love, or when you've just found out that you have cancer and you don't know if you're going to live, or when there's some kind of natural disaster or or some other kind of evil thing that happens in the world, you're going to be tempted to ask, where is God? And I'm here to tell you today, you better have an answer to that question. You better have an answer to that question, and you better get that answer now before it happens. We've been talking about idolatry, and well, what is an idol today? Because I don't think any of you are bowing down to statues today, but an idol is anything that you're tempted to love more than God, and we talked about that yesterday, but today we want to talk about an idol is anything you're tempted to trust more than God, and that's what we want to talk about today, because life is going to ask you some very serious questions. You better have some serious answers. And so I want you to take your Bibles, and I know it's Thursday morning, the energy level is getting a little low, but take your Bible, you're going to be using it, and I'm going to keep you awake by keeping you moving this morning in the Bible. And our main passage is going to be Psalm 115, so open up to Psalm 115. This will kind of be our main passage. We'll we'll look through it, but then we'll be bouncing around all over. So have your Bibles, have them ready. And let's just start with the first three verses of Psalm 115. It says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nations say, where is their God? There's the question right there. Where is God? And here it's the nation saying it to Israel because something bad has happened to them. Here's the answer. Verse 3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. And you're going to be asked that question, right? The next time that there's some hurricane that, that kills hundreds of people or there's a a school shooting and children or dead people are going to say, where is God? The answer is right there in verse three. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. When the world seems like it's out of control, 
God is 100% in control. Point number one, joyfully accept God's absolute sovereignty. Joyfully accept God's absolute sovereignty. And this is where you get into some big questions. Okay, if God is sovereign, what does that mean? That means God is in control. You see at the end of the word sovereign, reign. Sovereign isn't even another word for king. God is the king. He reigns. He is in control. And that's going to be, okay, well then, how is he good and is there evil? Or, okay, if God is in control, what about human responsibility? These are big questions. And one pastor I heard at one point said, when we're trying to answer these questions, we're swimming in the deep end of the theological pool, right? And so we need to have some humility as we think through this, because as he said, no one stands on their feet in the deep end. These are hard questions. Like I said, this is a question you'll be asked. If God is good and God is sovereign, then how is there evil in the world? How does that work out? And I would say when we're asked, these questions, the deep end is in a strong enough of analogy. We're like in an ocean uh, that, that is way beyond us, that is way too deep for us. Not only can you not stand on your feet, you can't even swim forever. Well, what you need is a boat in these deep waters because your own understanding isn't going to get you to the answers to these questions. You need a boat, you need a raft, and I want to tell you that raft that you need is right here. It's the word of God. When life asks you tough questions, you you need to go find the answers in God's word. Because if you lean on your own understanding, that's not going to get you there. And certainly if you listen to the world and their answers to the questions, that's not going to get you there either. You need to listen to the word of God. When life asks hard questions, you need to dig into the Bible for answers. And, And Another thing I've seen, as I've mentioned, doing all these youth camps and seeing young people who are singing praise songs then walk away from the Lord, another thing that's involved sometimes is something bad happens in their life, and they start asking these hard questions, and they say, nobody ever told me these questions before. Why wasn't anybody talking about this? Why doesn't the Bible talk about this? Okay, well, there may be some churches and some camps that aren't talking about that, but not this one, so you can't say that. And please don't ever say that the Bible isn't talking about those questions. If you think that the Bible says, follow Jesus and everything will just be all right, you haven't read the Bible. The Bible is full of hard things. The Bible is full of tragic situations. And so if you think the Bible's just painting this picture, this rainbows and butterflies and fairy tales, you haven't been reading the right book because that is not what the Bible says. And I hope that's not what our church or this youth group only talks about. We live in a world where babies die, where natural disasters happen, where evil things by evil people happen, and they seemingly get away with it. Where is God in all of that? Let's look at a few verses that I hope Uh, Come into your mind if you're in Psalm 115. Now we're going to keep moving through the Bible. Let's go to the right a little bit to Psalm 135. Let's go to Psalm 135. Starting in verse 5. It says, for I know that the Lord, and again, notice how that's written. That's going back to Exodus 3, the name of God, Yahweh. For I know that Yahweh is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever Yahweh pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. He it is who made the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain, who brings forth the wind from his storehouses. So if you're bummed out because free time, you can't go outside and do what you want if it's raining, well, God's doing whatever he pleases. God is sovereign. And remember the first night when we talked about the plagues, look at verse eight. He it is who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. So if the Egyptians, as they've got, as they're holding their dead firstborn in their arms, they're saying, where is God in all this? God's saying, I'm right here. And this was an act of judgment upon 
your society, before your sin and your refusal to listen to God. Uh, turn with me to Isaiah now. Just go over to the right. It's kind of, you'll flip through Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. I know you know where Song of Solomon is. And, and the next book is Isaiah, Isaiah 45. And as you get there, one thing you'll notice even Christians do when something bad happens, a lot of Christians try to like distance God from that. Oh, you know, this really bad thing happened. Well, pff, God didn't have anything to do with that. Okay, well, let, let's listen to what God says in Isaiah 45 and verse 5. He says, I am Yahweh, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, or Yahweh, there is no other. Now listen to this. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am Yahweh who does all these things. You see that right there? God just said, I create calamity. And when the world and even some pastors want to say, oh, you know, they act like God's just up in the heavens saying, oh no, what's going on? God's saying, I'm, I'm going to sign my name to that. I am Yahweh who does all these things. Now let's go to the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. And if we're saying, well, okay, God is sovereign, but like over how much? And if God is working things together for his master plan of history, well, how, how many things is he working to his master plan? Ephesians 1, verse 11 says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And there in the Greek, that word that's translated all things is a really technical word that means all things. How, how many things does God work according to his master plan? Everything. God is working according to his plan. And Exodus showed us, even that means God is sovereign over people because God was sovereign over Pharaoh. Now you start asking questions. Okay, does that make me a robot then? Does that mean I don't make real choices? And when you start asking that question or start even thinking, well, if God's sovereign, that means I don't make real choices. You know what you just did? You jumped off the boat and back into the ocean, right? Because that is not what the Bible says. The Bible nowhere teaches us that God's sovereignty somehow gets you or me off the hook, right? And the evil person who goes and shoots up a school, right? Well, is God sovereign over that? Yes, that person is responsible. They're the one that did the evil thing. And they're not let off the hook because of that. The Bible never, ever teaches that. The Bible teaches right next to each other, God is absolutely sovereign, and humans, you are responsible for your actions. And in some ways, that makes our human minds hurt, but that's what I'm saying, stay on the raft of the Bible, because that's what the Bible teaches. And so even a lot of the things that we see, the bad things that happen in the world, and we say, where is God? Why do bad things happen? Well, one answer we need to put out there is, well, a lot of things are just, it's a consequence for sin. Why do babies die? Why did I have to do two funerals for babies last year? Because we live in a sinful world. Now, the Bible makes clear that doesn't mean that every evil thing that happens is a direct response to some specific sin. I'm not saying that those people died or uh, other people die specifically because they sinned or their parents sinned. Jesus even talks about that, although sometimes that does happen. Uh, but in general, it's a consequence for sin. Because we live in a sinful world, God has cursed the world. And so when people are like, why do bad things happen? God's saying, this is what I told you would happen all the way back in Genesis 3, when humanity fell into sin. So when you see bad things happen, when someone you love dies because of cancer, don't get mad at God, get mad at sin. That, that happened because we live in a sinful world. 
Well, if you kind of go down that road, it, it gets you to an even bigger question. Okay, well, then why did God allow sin in the first place? Well, why did God even allow this to happen? And this, again, kind of brings us back to the problem of evil. And maybe even if you're talking to a non-Christian friend or if you go off to school, somebody's going to challenge you with what we call the problem of evil. Well, okay, Christian, you believe God's sovereign. How did evil get into the world? And we need to take a step back and consider that's even what we do when we're trying to tell a story that shows something Beautiful. Because if you step back and say, what's the point of history? Ultimately, it's to show God's glory. Why did God allow all those bad things to happen in Egypt? From night one, God made it very clear to show my glory. Even in Isaiah 45, God, he wants to show people that there is none like me. God is telling a story. And so I like to tell those people, if they're like, well, pff, how, how did God allow evil in the world? That makes him so wicked. I sometimes like to say, what, what's your favorite movie? What's your favorite story? They're like, well, that's a change of topic. Okay, well, what is it? Okay, does anything bad happen in that movie? Or does anything bad happen in that story? Well, yeah. Well, aren't you such a wicked person for liking a story where bad things happen? Nobody likes stories where nothing bad happens. That's like the whole point. There needs to be conflict. And here's the thing. You wouldn't know who God is. You wouldn't know the love of God. You wouldn't know the grace of God. You wouldn't know the mercy of God if there weren't bad things in the world. Even you wouldn't even really know what it is to love another person because true love requires sacrifice. You know what sacrifice feels like? A bad thing. All these things we would not know if God did not allow these things that we view as bad things into the story. And we need to admit that. I mean, you guys sang a song earlier from the movie Lion King which came out when I was a child, right? And maybe you're familiar with the story. Let's just think about this question. Who killed Mufasa? Who kills Mufasa? Scar kills Mufasa. And don't you get mad at Scar when that happens? And when the movie comes to the end, don't you want Scar to get his? Like, don't you want Scar to get defeated and get eaten by the hyenas? Aren't you like cheering inside when that happens? You're a bunch of monsters, that's so unfair. Scar didn't kill Mufasa. Disney killed Mufasa. <laughs> Scar, Scar didn't have a choice, guys. He, he was just doing, right? We don't think that way, right? And again, the analogy breaks down. There's, there's no perfect analogy to help us understand the infinite things of God. I'm just trying to show you, if we don't get mad at humans, when they come up with a story, to, and every story has some kind of message behind it, they allow conflict in the story to let that message shine. Why would we get mad at God when he allows evil in the world so he can get the point of the story across? We need to not talk back to God in that. And God is telling a story that points to his own glory. We would not know the glory of God if there was not conflict in the story. And then the questions that people will ask, well, that's not fair or that's not righteous of God. Uh, the Bible answers those. This is a good passage to just memorize or at least star in your Bible to know where it is when these questions come up. Go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 verses 5 through 8. Because if, if somebody brings up the problem of evil to you, the one passage I would go to would be Romans 3. And sometimes the person bringing up the problem of evil to you might be your own brain. <laughs> Asking that question. And it says there in Romans 3, 5 through 8, But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? And use Pharaoh as an example of there. Pharaoh's unrighteousness served to show the righteousness of God. What shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? And then he puts in parentheses, I, I speak in a human way. He's like saying, forgive me for asking this question. I know your teachers sometimes say there's no such thing as a dumb question. They're lying to you. Uh, there are such things as dumb questions. And that's what kind of Paul, like this is actually a dangerous question to imply that God is somehow 
unjust. Verse 6, by no means. For Then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. Paul's saying it's foolish to ask these questions or to think, well, if I, my lie shows the truth of God, I'll just lie some more and God will get more glory. No, that's foolish. And now that you've even heard these things, you know better. Don't ever use those things as an excuse for your own sin. God is holding you responsible for your actions. And that's where you don't get off the raft of the Bible and don't let go of it. Because here's why, there's no other raft that can float. In these deep waters and in these big questions, there's nothing else that's going to stand the test. Let's go back now to Psalm 115, our main passage this morning. Because he is telling them to trust in God and to give glory to God. But now he turns to idols. He turns to idols. And let me just read verses 4 through 8 for us in Psalm 115. It says, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. He's pointing out the absurdity of people who bow down to an idol of silver or gold. Isaiah speaks of this. He's mocking the idols. You know, hey, I get some wood, I chop up some of it, and I turn it into a fire, and I cook my food over it, and then I carve up the rest of it and bow down to it as a god. What? And that's where, again, in a post-enlightenment Western society, you guys are already on this same page. You guys are already like, yeah, that's ridiculous. Who would do that? Because not really anybody in your society is doing that. But we still have other things that we are tempted to trust instead of God. Point number two, see the futility of the alternatives. God is absolutely sovereign. And joyfully accept that and see that every other option is futile. And there's any other raft you're tempted to jump onto to sail you through these deep waters and answer these big questions, it's not going to float. Let's think through some things that people are tempted to trust today instead of God. Probably the first one that comes to mind is money. Now, that might not be tempting for you young people because you feel like, I don't have any of that. But trust me, it will be tempting, and maybe even it is right now. And there's many verses we could go to. Uh, just jot this one down. Proverbs 23, 4 and 5 says, Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning, be smart enough to desist, stop. When your eyes light on it, your wealth, it is gone. For suddenly it sprouts wings, flying like an eagle toward heaven. And someday your money will let you down because you'll, you'll lose a job. Or you'll make a bad investment and you'll lose a lot of money. And you'll start to realize money can't even get you the things that you really want. Even the Beatles, who weren't exactly godly guys, could figure out money can't buy me love. But also, not only money can't get you the things you really want, money can't stop the things you're really afraid of, right? Those two families that lost babies last year, no amount of money could have saved those babies, right? And trust me, they would have spent everything they had if it would have. But, but money can't stop those things that, that you're truly afraid of. Money is futile as an alternative for trusting in God. For many of you, what will be tempting is a relationship. I'm going to trust in the security of this relationship more than I trust in God. If I could just be with that special someone, I would be safe and I would be secure. Please listen to me. That is such a lie. 
Don't believe that. Because if you do, even if that relationship you want to happen happens, if that's the mindset you bring into that relationship, as a wise man once said, get used to disappointment, right? That's going to be an awful relationship because you are putting expectations on that other person that they will never be able to keep. Really what you're doing is you're putting that person in the place of God. And I do a lot of marriage counseling. I see that all the time. Wives that are expecting their husbands to be this perfect man. There was only one perfect man. His name was Jesus, and none of the ladies in our church are married to him, okay? Right? And, and they're, they're, they're putting their husband on a pedestal that he'll never be able to lift up to. So the wife is going to be perpetually disappointed. And, and many husbands kind of do the same to their wives. They expect their wives to be perfect. And, and all kinds of problems come from that, all kinds of disappointment Some of the things that we talked about yesterday, discontentment, lust, all of these things stem from someone putting too much of an emphasis and too much of a trust in a relationship. Many people are tempted to trust in their physical strength or even just things that like health. Hey, I'm not going to be like all the slobs in our society who don't discipline themselves. I'm going to take care of my body. And believe me, I would encourage you, Please take care of your body. Hydration never takes a vacation. Drink water. Take care of your body. And something my high school basketball coach taught me that I think is worth passing on is don't eat like you're 20 when you're 30, or you'll look and feel like you're 50 when you're 40, right? Just put that one away. And remember that one. Your leaders are laughing because they know it's true, okay? Please take care of yourself, but also please don't think that's going to protect you from everything. You can take care of yourself and be disciplined and exercised and eat right and still get cancer. You can still get hit by a bus and and die in a car accident when you least expect it. Every time you guys get in a car, I hope you know you're taking your life in your hands, right? And, And you, you never know when your time may come. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. For I am the Lord who practices love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. And even that one reminds us of of wisdom. Don't let knowledge become an idol to you. You know, we live in the information age. How's that going for us? Are we really better, happier than everyone else? No, our knowledge still has limits. And even when we trust in that knowledge more than other things, we'll end up going astray. Don't leave the raft of God's word and trusting in what the Bible says and the sovereignty of God for any of those things. But here's one of the biggest ways I think you'll actually be tempted to jump, off, to jump off the raft of the Bible and to start trusting in someone else, especially when something really bad happens in your life. This is what you're going to be tempted to trust in. You're going to be tempted to trust in what makes sense to you. That's what so many people do. Even they look at what the Bible says and they say, well, I don't really understand that or that seems too difficult. I'm gonna go with what makes sense to me because there's gonna come a point in your life where something doesn't make sense, where you're looking at the Bible, you're looking at your circumstances and still you're struggling to put the pieces together. And here's some things that people do in those moments. They get angry at God or they just kind of write off the sovereignty of God. Well, that can't actually be true. Or maybe they go even so far as to say, well, then God just must not be real at all. Or people hold God responsible and blame him for the problems in their lives. And you can talk to any one of the pastors, probably any one of your leaders. We see people do that all the time. But again, the question I would want to ask you and even get you to think ahead of, will any of those things actually make you feel any better? When life doesn't make sense to you to saying, well, I guess there's no God at all, is that actually going to make you feel better? What kind of crazy world is that? Even when an atheist challenges you with the problem of evil, flip it right back on them. Okay, yeah, that actually, that's a fair question. 
If God is good and God is sovereign, how is there evil in the world? Okay, well, Mr. Atheist, how do you even know what evil is if there is no God? Who's to say even what's good and what's evil? You actually have a bigger problem of evil than I do because you don't even know what it is. There's no purpose behind it. There's nothing. Any answers apart from the Bible will ultimately be empty. They will be hopeless and they will not help you. And I've seen people as a pastor again and again go through trials. And usually when life doesn't make sense, when things are really hard, people do one of two things. They either run to God or they run from God. And I'm telling you, I've watched this movie so many times. The people that run to God find rest, find hope, find encouragement. And don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that their life somehow magically all gets better and everything works out like a fairy tale ending. No, but they have strength in the midst of the battle. And the people that run from God, they just waste away and they become angry or they become depressed or both And it's all kinds of sad things. And again, I've seen it so many times. You can believe me now or you can believe me later. I'm just saying at some point, a trial is going to hit your life. Run to God. Run to his word. Surround yourself with his people and you will find strength. You will find hope even in the midst of tragedy. Don't bail on the raft of the Bible for the raft of what makes sense to you. That raft doesn't float. And let's think for a moment about a famous story in the Bible, the story of Job. His life wasn't making sense to him. You familiar with this story? He's a righteous man. He follows God. But Satan, he does what he does. He's an accuser, and he accuses Job before God. He accuses Job basically of, well, God, he's just following you because look at his life. It's great. He's rich, He's got a great family. Of course he's going to follow you. If you take everything he has, he'll curse you to your face. So God says, okay, Satan, take everything he has. And in one day, Job loses everything. All of his flocks, which you're like, who cares about flocks? Well, that was their money back then. He loses all of his money, basically, and all of his children die in one day. Does Job curse God to his face? No. He says, blessed be the name of God the Lord. And so then Satan says, well, if you actually took his health away, then he would curse you. So God says, okay, Satan, take his health away. And God takes his health away. And even his wife is saying, Job, just curse God. And he says, no. Are we going to accept good things from God, but not bad things? No, we should accept whatever God gives us. And that's usually where most people stop with the story of Job. Oh, look at his great example. And that is a good example. But then there gets to be this long dialogue where three of Job's friends come and they start talking and they basically start giving Job bad advice saying, Job, you must have done something wrong for all these bad things to happen. And Job's saying, no, there's no sin that I know of in my life. And we know from the story of God and Satan, it wasn't because he was in sin that these bad things happened. It actually happened because he was righteous. But in the midst of all that, Job does start, even though he still trusts God and he never curses God, he does start to question God. He does start to kind of demand answers from God. And at the end of the story, God shows up. And let's look at that. Turn with me to Job. It's right before the book of Psalms in your Bibles. And go to the end of the book of Job, Job chapter 38. Because God has been, or Job has been going back and forth with his friends, uh, talking about all of these different things. And finally, God just shows up. And it, it, God shows up, it, it says, in a whirlwind. And we don't know exactly what, what, what does that mean? Was it like a tornado or some kind of windstorm? But in chapter 38, it says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Job is questioning God and God shows up and says, really? You want to play that game? 
And so God starts questioning him with all kinds of questions like this. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And he goes through creation in verse 12. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? And goes again through all the things talking about the rain, talking about the stars. Or then he gets into the animals in verse or chapter 39. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the does? He goes in through all of these things saying, hey, Job, where were you? Do you know how to do this? And the implied answer to all of them is no, no, no. And so how does Job respond? If you go to chapter 40 now and verse 3, then Job answered the Lord Yahweh and said, behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. But then God keeps going. He continues to question Job about all these things that he does. And Job again answers in chapter 42, verse 1, Then Job answered Yahweh and said, I know that you can do all things. See, there it is, God's absolute sovereignty. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Job's basically saying, that's, that's me. Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. And then he quotes God again, here and I will speak. I will question you and you make it known to me. And Job answers, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Here, Job is very much a counterexample to the example of Pharaoh. Pharaoh, who continually hardens his heart and never lets go, never surrenders to God. Job here is a great opposite example of that. When confronted with his questioning of God, he says, God, you're right. You're God, and I'm not. So I'm going to shut up now, and I'm not going to talk, and I'm going to repent in dust and and ashes. Don't play the what makes sense to me game. And I want to give you one more reason for that. And this is the biggest reason I can think of why the what makes sense to me raft doesn't float. Because you know what else doesn't make sense to me? Sure, there's some things that have happened in my life that I'm like, God, this isn't making sense to me. What's going on? Sure. But here's another thing that doesn't make sense to me. Giving one of my sons so my enemies can be forgiven of the judgment they deserve and join my family. That doesn't make sense to me, but it makes sense to God, and you better rejoice that it is. And even in all of this, you know, even okay, isn't, is that mean of God to inflict like pain on us so that we can see his glory? Here's something that you need to remember. God isn't just sitting up in heaven saying, yeah, How do you like that? No, God joins us in the pain. He joins us in the suffering. Remember one passage we looked at the other night when we talked about the Passover, Isaiah 53? Listen again to how the passage I read that night starts, Isaiah 53, 4. It's talking about Jesus, and it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our our sorrows. When bad things happen and you're tempted to say, where is God? And you know, part of that answer is God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. You need to know he's not up there just dispassionate, just saying, well, tough for you guys. No, he has borne our griefs and he has carried our sorrows by Jesus Christ coming into this world and living in this broken world and enduring the worst that this world has to offer through death on a cross. God has joined the grief. He has shared the sorrow so that you and I might be saved. Don't play the what makes sense to me game. It doesn't work. And you better be glad that it doesn't work. And even you think about the events of the crucifixion, and it describes those after the fact in Acts chapter 2. Peter is speaking on the day of Pentecost. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, why don't you go ahead and turn there? We'll look at two passages really close to each other in Acts. It makes it clear 
that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, which trust me, if you were there on that first Good Friday, you would be saying, this doesn't make sense to me. Jesus, I thought he was the Messiah. How is he crucified? That doesn't make sense to me. This doesn't seem right. God, where are you? But in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 22, Peter says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, and now listen to this, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So there again, you see God holds them responsible. They killed Jesus, but it also says this was what God planned and God knew this would happen. God wasn't surprised at this. Or if you go uh, to chapter four, just across the page or a couple pages over, that they're praying about the persecution they're experiencing. And in verse 27, it says, for truly in this city, Jerusalem, There were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. These were big, powerful people and powerful groups of people. And what were they doing? Verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. If you would have been there on that first Good Friday, it wouldn't have made sense to you. But it was God's plan. God knew exactly what he was doing. So I know some of this has maybe been a little bit heady, but let's try to get practical and wrap up. Go back to me now to Psalm 115. So what? What should you do in the midst of all of this? God is sovereign. There's no viable alternative to this. Where does he go to after talking about the futility of idols? Let's just look at verses 9 through 13. O Israel, trust in the Lord, Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. You who fear Yahweh, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord, Yahweh, has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. He calls all people from the house of Israel to the house of Aaron, the priests, to everyone who fears the Lord. Trust in God because he is your help and your shield. Another word that's used in the Psalms is he's your refuge. Point number three, find refuge in the great I am. Find refuge in the great I am. And I want you to know this is conditional. The promises here are, I guess in our case, we would say for those who fear the Lord. What does that mean? What we talked about in session one, those who surrender their will to God. So what we talked about yesterday, those who are born again, those who have turned from their sin and put their trust in Christ. But when you do that, when you trust in Christ, you are now in the most secure position you could possibly be. It's something I like to call the triangle of trust, okay? The Bermuda Triangle, that's, that's a bad place. You don't want to be there. The Triangle of Trust, that's a great place. You want to be there. Because if you are somebody who fears the Lord, you are surrounded by three amazing truths. Let me go through them with you real quickly. The first is that God wants what's best for you. If you are somebody who fears the Lord, God wants what is best for you. Psalm 103, 13 says, As a father shows compassion to his children... So the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. God shows compassion on us like a father to his children. You talk to any father, what they want probably more than anything in the world is what is best for their children. And if we, being evil, know how to do that, how much more does God want what is best for his kids? Well, here's the second truth. God knows what is best for you. God knows what is best 
for you. Romans 11, 33 through 36 says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to God that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So there, God's wisdom is deep. It, it won't always make sense to you in the moment, but he knows. He knows what is best. So God wants what is best for you. God knows what is best for you. And finally, well, if God is sovereign, like we have been saying, God can do what is best for you. So God knows what's best. He wants what's best. And he can do what is best. When you surround yourself with those three truths, do you see how secure of a place that is? Because you can look at even tragic situations and say, hey, God knows what he's doing. God wants what's best for me. And God can do what's best for me. And let me just close with one final passage that'll give you both the big picture and the small picture. Go with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We'll end here. And again, this is a passage that speaks honestly, okay? It's a passage that reminds us we live in a broken world. It even describes the whole world that we're living in is groaning like a woman in labor with a child, right? The world right now is in pain and it's groaning, right? The world is not great. The Bible warns us of that. And this is even the passage I read right there at the graveside with this tiny casket. And it tells us in verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So what's the big picture? That no matter how bad it is in your life, you can know this is the big picture of what God is doing. God is in the process of eventually restoring all of creation. And the world right now is broken. It's bad. And the Bible's not saying, oh, it's not that bad, guys. No, it's bad. But it's saying, however bad the world is, it's not as bad as how good it's going to be when God fixes everything. And that's what we hope for. Verse 24, for in this hope we are saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? Of course, it doesn't make sense right now. You have to hope and, and you have to trust God is doing this. This is the big picture. Okay, well then what about the little picture? Verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. The big picture is that God is going to restore all of creation. The smaller picture, the more personal picture, is God is going to use everything in your life for good. Now, that begs the question, what good are we talking about? Well, verse 29 helps us with that. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the good. God is going to use everything in your life as a Christian to make you more like Jesus. Now we get down to the real root of it. Is that what you want? If you're someone who fears the Lord, you should say, yes, that is what I want more than anything, more than anything in this world. I want to be like Jesus. If that's not what you want more than anything, well, then guess what you've got? Idols. You've got idols. Whatever it is that you want more than to be like Christ, that's an idol. But God, as one pastor once said, if he loves you, he will move heaven and earth to make you more like Jesus. Now, trust me, when heaven and earth are being moved, you're not going to like that. <laughs> but you have to trust, God is making me more like Christ so that you can be able to say like verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? How does God give us, his people, all things? By using them all 
to make us more like Christ. So who are you going to trust? Your options are Yahweh, the one true God, or, well, there's a really long list. But all those, they're just as useless as the idols of silver and gold that we read about in Psalm 115. There is one true God. He alone should win the battle for your trust. And I pray that he does. Let's pray together. Father, I know that we live in a difficult world. And I know some of these students have gone through things in their own lives where they've learned that, they've seen that firsthand. And God, I know that all of them, especially as they grow, they will see more and more the brokenness of the world that we live in. And God, I pray that they would start now by trusting in you. And that when those bad things happen, they wouldn't run to some other explanation that they wouldn't run from God or get angry at God, that they would run to you because they're depending on you and they're depending on your word to give them the answers to the hard questions that life is going to ask them. God, I pray that they would trust you and that they would lean into your word, that they would trust in the Lord with all their heart, God, and not lean on their own understanding, but that they would lean into your word And that, God, they would know the security that comes from surrounding themselves with the truth that you want what's best for us. You know what's best for us. You can do what's best for us. And you're renewing all things in creation. And, God, you're using everything to make us more like Christ. Fill this room with hope and joy as we celebrate your sovereignty this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.